This lecture will cover Wuchereria bancrofti and Brugia malayi, the worms of filariasis. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for Wuchereria and Brugia are to understand their life cycle, so you can break that life cycle, know who gets the infection, and recognize how it will present, because presentation will vary depending on the phase of infection. Know how to make a diagnosis and understand the fundamentals of treatment. Know how to sterilize the adult worms, kill the babies, and manage the complications of filariasis. Here we are on the tree of life. We are in the roundworm section, in particular the tissue nematode or roundworms. This is where things start. Things with brugia and wuchereria start with the microfilaria. A microfilaria is a microscopically small worm, well smaller than a millimeter long, and it lives initially inside the gut of a mosquito. Now, when they live in the mosquitoes, they eat what the mosquito eats, they consume what the mosquito consumes, and they become colonized with the healthy, helpful bacteria in the gut of the mosquito. That family of bacteria is called Wolbachia, and Wolbachia is to the mosquito like E. coli and other Enterobacteriaceae are to you and me. They need those bacteria to survive, and the worms have evolved to depend on those Wolbachia bacteria also. That's important for you as a medical doctor, and I'll explain why shortly. So, the mosquito does what mosquitoes do. They fly around, they sniff your body odor, they find you, and they bite you. And when they do, these microscopically small microfilarial worms will come out of the saliva of the proboscis of the mosquito, and they will invade your tissue. And eventually, they make their way throughout the body, but in particular, they like to get to your lymphatics. When they get to the lymphatic channels of the body, they love that. They groove on your lymphatic fluid, all the, the fat and the nutrients and the fluid and electrolytes that are in your lymph, they groove on that and they grow into adults. The adults are macroscopic, they're perhaps a centimeter long, uh, and they like hanging out with other adults. They will live in your lymphatics, they will have an orgy uh, constantly reproducing, and instead of laying eggs, they give birth to live babies. We call the babies microfilariae. Those microfilariae will stay in the lymphatics, but eventually they have to become adventuresome and venture out into the vascular blood supply. That only happens at nighttime. I think that's because the babies uh, have evolved to understand somehow when it's nighttime because they know that's when the mosquitoes are more likely to come out and bite the patient. Being in your blood supply is a violent, hostile place for these microfilariae. You have a liver and a spleen and lungs and a whole reticuloendothelial immune response that is very efficient at hoovering up these foreign invaders. But unless they do venture into the bloodstream, they won't be able to perpetuate the life cycle. They do, and over a period of time, it's the adults, not the babies, but the adults that will cause scarring and inflammation and repair of the lymphatic channels. As the lymphatic channels are scarred down, they become less efficient at sucking up the lymphatic fluid. This leads to a backlog. Uh, a sluggish return flow of the lymphatic fluid. That's called lymph edema, and I'll show you pictures of this, but it's literally an enlargement of the dependent part of the body that's normally serviced by the lymphatic fluid. So this is an anthroponosis. It's an infection of humans. It is vector-borne by mosquitoes. In your lymphatic channels, they give birth to live babies. That's called viviparous reproduction. And those adults have that same Wolbachia that they've taken with them since they were babies in the guts of the mosquito. The disease happens when the adults clog and scar up your lymphatics, and when the microfilariae migrate through your tissues, they may also cause disease. The epidemiology of filariasis happens across the tropics worldwide. All that's required are mosquitoes feeding on people who are infected, and evidently there are perhaps 90 million infected people uh, globally today. So how does it present clinically? Two different ways. First of all, there's disease caused by the adult worms. When the adult worms block your lymphatic channel that causes lymphedema. The old-fashioned term for this is elephantiasis. It's an infection that's been known since antiquity, and any dependent part of the body can be impacted. Not only the arms and legs, the extremities, but also breasts and genital involvement. This is an old-time uh, plate from an uh, old medical atlas, but this problem still exists today, as you can see in these photographs by the World Health Organization's Tropical Disease Resource Branch. As you can imagine, it's not only stigmatizing and dysfunctional, it's also dangerous because every time there's a furrow, a fold, 
in the skin, that is the potential portal of entry for bacteria. When bacterial infection of the skin happens, that's called cellulitis, that leads to damage of the lymphatic system. When there's damage of the lymphatic system, there's more lymphedema. When there's more lymphedema, there's more skin furrows. You can imagine how this cycle perpetuates itself. In extreme cases, when the lymphatic channels of the body are blocked by so many adult worms, they will become wildly dilated and they may rub physically through friction, rub against the ureters as they drain the kidneys. You can end up with a lymphatic ureteral fistula or anastomosis. And this means that when someone eats uh, and they get nutrients out of their intestines, instead of going back into the liver as chylomicrons, they will spill out in the urine. That's called chyluria. People urinate and it looks like whole milk. It's not only strange looking, it's also one way to lead to malnutrition in these patients. It is a chronic, debilitating, awful, awful disease. That's what the adults do. What do the babies do? Usually not much. Most people with a light infection will not have symptoms related to the microfilariae in their blood, but in high worm burdens, where every night, night after night, there are more and more microfilariae uh, migrating through the bloodstream and into the tissues, this can cause problems, in particular the lungs. With microfilariae in the lungs, there's an immune response, IgE-mediated, recruiting eosinophils to that area, and that causes cough and wheeze, shortness of breath or dyspnea, and even eosinophils in the pleural and the pulmonary fluid itself. So this should sound familiar to you. This is reminiscent of Luffler's syndrome. We've seen with hookworms, with ascaris, uh, with strongyloides, but this is much more chronic. It's much more persistent, and the name we give it is tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. Now, how do you make a diagnosis? First of all, have your clinical suspicion. If your patient has lymphedema or chyluria or pulmonary eosinophilia and they've been exposed to parts of the world where this infection happens, think about it. And then confirm your suspicion. So first of all, look for the adults. This is a scrotal ultrasound and you can see the adults are cruising in the scrotum. They are dancing. This is called the filarial dance sign. And that is uh, pathognomonic for the infection. But you can also look for the babies. And in order to do that, we do a nocturnal blood film. Same kind of blood film you do for malaria, but done at nighttime, because that's when the microfilariae are most likely to be in the bloodstream. And if in the microscope you see one of these microscopic worms, you've made your diagnosis. In the United States, we also have the luxury of serology, in particular a subcategory of IgG called IgG4, which in the proper clinical context is very specific for infection due to filariasis. How do we treat filariasis? Well, there's two considerations. First of all, if you're treating an individual patient, someone who comes to see you as a medical doctor and says, please help me, I am sick, then we can handle them in a particular way. First of all, we try to sterilize the adult worms. It turns out that the adult worms that live in the lymphatics, they are relatively resistant to the activity of anti-helminthic treatments. We don't know why. But we do know that if we kill their Wolbachia, that endosymbiotic bacteria, they get very sick. They're less horny, they're less fertile, and eventually they may actually die. And so we give them an antibacterial called doxycycline, not to kill the worm, but to kill the bugs inside the worm and make them sick. These require weeks, sometimes six weeks of treatment. And so it's a toxic problem. It does require you to work with that individual patient to make sure they take their medicine. And yes, we do add albendazole because that may help, but that doesn't seem to be the main driving factor. And that works for an individual, but not for an overall population. So there's a chemical called DEC, diethylcarbamazine, that tends to reduce tropical pulmonary eosinophilia because although it does not target the adults, it kills the babies. It doesn't truly cure these patients, the adults are still there, but it can reduce transmission in the community, and it can tend to reduce their wheezing and coughing if they have a lot of babies cruising through their lungs. The second part of treatment, of course, is to manage the complications. Anything we can do to reduce cellulitis is important. So these patients need access to clean water, they need soap, they need good shoe gear, they need to reduce their risk of bacterial invasion of the skin. In severe cases, we can try to repair the lymphatic channels that have become dilated, but that's very challenging to do. And in these areas, that is usually not, unfortunately, an option in advanced filariasis. In terms of prevention, it's all about breaking the cycle, right? So number one, kill the mosquitoes. If there are no mosquitoes to transmit the infection, there will not be filariasis. By the way, there also will not be malaria and dengue and all kinds of other vector-borne infections. These are pictures uh, of discarded tires by the side of the road. They collect rainwater. 
those mosquitoes will reproduce in the stagnant water. You have to go after where these mosquitoes breed and get rid of those breeding sites. Number two, you can also reduce the burden of infection in your patients. DEC is so well tolerated that in certain affected areas in the tropics, it's been added to their cooking salt. So every time you eat salt, you're dosing yourself with a little bit of DEC. Again, that doesn't kill the adult worms in their lymphatics, but it kills the babies. And when you kill off those babies, it means that when the mosquito does inevitably come for a blood meal, it's less likely to be able to suck up new microfilariae, less likely to perpetuate the life cycle. So those are the key concepts for Wuchereria and Brugia, the worms that cause filariasis. They're tissue nematodes, they're transmitted by mosquitoes, and they contain endosymbiotic Wolbachia bacteria. This happens throughout the tropics and people tend to get infected over and over again. Clinical disease is mostly because of the adult worms. They live in the lymphatic channels and they cause obstruction and lymphedema, but the microfilariae can also cause disease when they migrate through your tissue, especially the lungs. Make a diagnosis by looking for the adults on ultrasound, looking for the microfilariae with nighttime blood films, and if you have the luxury of serology, send that test as well. We treat with doxycycline to kill the Wolbachia, and we add albendazole. That's to go after the adults, but we can also manage uh, patients in terms of their tropical pulmonary eosinophilia with DEC, which goes after the babies. Uh, and of course, we have to manage complications of cellulitis. We prevent the infection cycle by controlling the vectors and giving mass doses of DEC to entire populations. Thank you so much for your attention.